Hey everybody, it is great having you join us from wherever you're watching. And if you are new to Journey at Home, take a second right now, hit that like and subscribe button so you can stay connected with our community here and enjoy all of this great content. And I gotta tell you, for those of you who are watching for the first time, I am so glad you are. You could not have picked a better day to tune in. And especially those of you who maybe you're checking this out, but you're really skeptical about church and you know, faith in general or what you believe about God. Maybe you feel like Christians are a bunch of hypocrites. You're right about that, by the way, but you're gonna love today. Uh, this is one of my favorite things we do every single year because I'm gonna invite all of you to practice with me getting better at the only command Jesus gave us to follow. That's right, you heard me right. There's only one rule in following Jesus. He didn't give us a hundred things to do. He didn't even give us 10 commandments to follow, which is good because I don't know if I could remember them all. There's just one. Right before his arrest, he looked at his disciples and he said, a new command I give you, love one another. To which I know we all think I do. Oh, that's easy. You know, I'm good then if that's all I got to do. But no, no, no. He's not talking about feeling loving. We all have that down. And he's not talking about being loving to people who like and want, uh, who like us or people that we like and people that we want to love. Anybody can do that. We've got that down. No, he defined what love looks like and he raised the bar by setting the standard himself. He said, as I have loved you, so you must love one another. And let me remind you, just a few hours after he said that, he hung on a Roman cross and he demonstrated love in a way that took their breath away as he gave his last breath away. So he wasn't talking about any normal kind of love. This is a sacrificial, supernatural kind of love. Now, I'm going to tell you, I think it's impossible to display without God's help and work in your life. But here's a good thing. When you read the New Testament documents, you know what you find? These documents are simply the author's way of explaining why we should make loving like Jesus our rule for life and what this kind of love looks like and what it doesn't. That's all you're reading when you read the New Testament documents. These authors call all of us Jesus followers to a life that reflects this love in everything we say, in everything we do, and in everything we think. Now, why would that be such a big deal? Because that night Jesus looked at his disciples and said, by this everyone will know that you're my disciples if you love one another this way. In other words, the thing that you should be known for, we Jesus followers, the things that ought to distinguish us from everyone else, the thing that should authenticate and demonstrate your love for God is your supernatural, sacrificial, others-focused love for all the people around you. So because of that, every year about this time, we come together at Journey and we practice loving people where we live in a way that they can tangibly see and the way we do it is through no-strings-attached generosity. And the reason we practice is, well, we need practice, right? Everything in our world, everything in our nature, it just pulls us to focus on ourselves, pulls us to be greedy, to be self-centered. So we have to learn how love acts, and we have to learn what love does. Now, this isn't a new idea. I didn't come up with it. 2,000 years ago, there's this young guy named Timothy who was pastoring a church in Ephesus, and apparently the people there in that church were having trouble loving people the way Jesus had loved them. And so Paul writes a letter to Timothy telling him what we all need to do to get better at loving. And here's what he told Timothy. He said, you command those who are rich in this present world, which doesn't sound like any of us, does it? You're not rich. I'm not rich. We all know people who are rich, and they probably need to hear how to be more loving, but it's not true for us. I mean, you don't feel rich, do you? No, of course not. Let me tell you why. Because you don't have any margin. You don't feel rich because you spend or invest or save everything that you have. I'm convinced the only people who actually feel rich are multi-multi-millionaires who literally have more money than they know what to do with, and teenagers. Teenagers who have jobs but live at home, and so they have no expenses, so they feel rich too. But you don't think you're rich because you don't feel rich, and well, you don't think you're rich because you don't have as much as the people around you have. Isn't that true? I mean, no matter how much you have, you know people and I know people who have more. They're the rich people. But listen, Paul, when he writes this, is actually talking to you and me. Because in Scripture, rich just means you have more than you need. And let's be honest, you have some amount of extra, don't you? So do I. We have extra money, we have extra food, we have extra space in the house, you know, we have extra cars, extra vacations, extra investments, extra, 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 we could go on all day. And that's not a bad thing. I mean, you shouldn't feel guilty you have extra. God's blessed you with it. But Paul's point is you should be very careful with your extra because being rich or having extra, what well, comes with some unique temptations. So he warns us, 
He says, command those who are rich not to be arrogant. Now, I know you're not arrogant either, but Paul's not just talking about the rich people who think they're better than everyone else. He's actually talking about a trap that having extra creates for all of us. It's the feeling that now that I have extra, I'm independent. See, when you literally live day to day and you have to pray, give me this day my daily bread, you are not tempted to feel independent at all. You are, your dependence is very obvious to you and everyone else. But what happens when we get extra? We start believing we're independent. And independence creates arrogance. Independence leads us to act as if we don't need God and we don't need anybody else. Now I feel like I'm in control of my life. I have planned for all the contingencies. I can handle whatever comes my way. And the worst part is you may have fallen in this trap and not even known it. You may have fallen in this trap and you may be celebrating it because in America, independence is the goal. I mean, we all want autonomy, don't we? But autonomy, doing whatever I want, whenever I want, because I got enough money to pay for it, well, that can lead to arrogance, which creates a distance between us and God and a distance between us and others. So Paul tells Timothy, you warn those rich people not to be arrogant, nor, he says, to put their hope in wealth, which is so uncertain. Now, none of us would say our hope is in money. But the more money you have, the stronger the temptation becomes to trust in it for your security. I'll prove it to you. How much money do you need to feel totally secure for life? It's not a rhetorical question. Think about it. How much money do you need to feel totally secure for life? I know your answer. It's just a little bit more than you have right now. And that's always going to be your answer. Because the more you have, the more tempted you are to trust what you have to protect you and to think, well, a little bit more will make me even more secure because it'll remove even more risk. But Paul says that is a terrible idea because all of your wealth is uncertain. It can be here today, be gone tomorrow. So you should never put your hope and security in something so temporary. Instead, Paul gives an alternative solution, if you will. He says, instead, put their hope in God who richly provides us with everything for our enjoyment. Paul says, all right, I want you to shift your hope from what you can hold to the one who actually holds you. Why don't you put your hope in a God who promises to generously provide you with everything you need for your enjoyment? How about you put your trust in the one who is certain and cannot be taken or shaken from you? I'm just telling you, if you aren't intentional about keeping your hope in God, if you let your hope slide into what you have, there's going to come a moment when you're going to be disappointed. I have watched this happen to people my entire life, and I've fallen in this trap. I've watched people put their hope in their wealth, and then they lose a job, they lose their business, their world falls apart, you know, they lose a child, their wife walks out on them one day. Whatever they go through, you know what they discover? Their money is useless. When everything falls apart, and it will one day fall apart on all of us because life's tough, this is going to become perfectly clear to you because you will not pray to your money for help. Of course not. That'd be silly. In that moment, you're going to cry out to God, aren't you? Because then it'll be crystal clear. You'll know the source of your hope. So all Paul's saying is, hey, don't wait for everything to fall apart to figure that out. Go ahead and shift your trust from all the gifts you have to the giver. Go ahead and shift your trust from all that stuff you can hold on to right now to the one who actually holds you. But in a world where we're all rich, and we're constantly being pulled into looking for security in what we have, that's just not easy. So how do you avoid the traps that being rich brings? Well, Paul tells us. He says, command them to do good, to be rich in good deeds, and to be generous and willing to share. That's interesting. It's like Paul believed the key to shifting your hope and security from what you have to your heavenly Father. Well, the key is what you actually do with what you have. Paul says, okay, because you're rich, just means you have extra. Because you're rich, you have extra. You can do more, and you can give more. That's what loving like Jesus looks like. You can do more good because you have more opportunity to do good. You're rich, after all. You have more than you need. And you can give more. You can be more generous because, again, you got more than you need. Now, we'll talk more about what that means in our next episode. But today, I want us to start practicing what we're talking about. I want you to start practicing doing more and giving more. And I've got an opportunity for you. It's our annual four offering. Now, let me explain why we do this. When we first started our church, we decided instead of having our own food pantries, you know, our own 
care and benevolence ministries and all that, we, would, we said, no, 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 let's not pioneer something, let's partner. Instead, let's identify organizations in our community that are already doing a great job at those things and just partner with them. So every year, we find the best organizations doing impactful work in our communities, and then we ask them, okay, what can we do to help? So for those of you who are new to this, this is how it works. And if you're not a Christian or you're just checking this out, you know, wondering what our church is about, this is why I'm so glad you're here today. You may think churches are just out to get your money, but that's not what this is about. We give away every single dollar that's given, and we show you where we give it away. So this year, your no-strings-attached generosity is going to do some really powerful things. You're going to provide assistance to kids and families in our community. You're going to do things like create play spaces for kids at our city park. You're going to help nonprofits in their work to solve hunger and homelessness issues for kids and for families. We're going to encourage and support nonprofit leaders in our communities with some training that they're actually asking for and desperately need. We're going to help some families who are in crisis right now. And I could go on and on. That's just the start of it. But this is a huge opportunity for us to come together and impact literally thousands of lives in our communities. And so I want you to play. I want everybody to play. It's really simple to give. You can scan the QR code that is on the screen right now, and you can choose the annual four offering fund, or you can go to givejourney.com and do the same thing. Or if you're old school and you want to write a check, you know, you can write a check to Journey. You can put four in the memo line, and you can mail it to us at 2314 Bren Road, Murray, Kentucky, 42071. And all of you skeptics who think I'm out to get your money, okay, I'll admit I'm right, or I'm doing that. You're right this one time. You know, I'm, I am asking for your money because we're not going to keep it. This is going to make such an impact for people who need it. If you come here regularly but you don't give or you don't give generously, I want to ask you to give big. And if you give here at Journey regularly, I'm, I'm counting on you to give even bigger. Because it's our responsibility to come together and to do good, to be generous for those who need it. So again, you're not giving to our church. You're just giving through our church to help a lot of people in our communities. See, loving like Jesus loves us means we keep getting better at doing what Jesus did for us. And he gave us the ultimate demonstration of what no strings attached generosity looks like. So for those of us who are Christians, hey, let's be known for what our leader and our king was known for. Let's love where we live. Let's show our community that we are for them. And I'm so grateful that you're willing to be a part of this with us. You got any questions or thoughts, I'd love for you to drop them in the comments. And if you think this would be helpful with a friend, be sure to share it. And if you're here in the Murray area, come on and see us on Sunday at the Four Center at 9 or 1030 any Sunday. We would love to have you.